thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I feel a lot of people will, I feel a bit like Mao Zedong said about education. It's about giving people back in an organized way what they know already. So in a sense, I think a lot of you know all this already. But maybe my perspective is slightly different uh, because it's probably not so much from social work or that perspective, but more from polit political economy perspective, uh, sociological, and of course from the ethics of care, which is of great interest to me as well. Um, I'm going to just uh, briefly outline what I'm going to say. I'm going to talk about initially, uh, I'm fascinated when people say that the discourse and debates have no language about care or love or empathy. Well, of course they don't, and that's influenced by the theories of justice which dominate political discourse, which I'm going to start to comment on. And I'm going to talk then about this concept of effective equality. We published a book on this in 2009. It's been translated now into an, well, some Bulgarian, Korean, already in, in um, Spanish. And it's a way of framing uh, political theory and a new way of naming something and maybe bringing it to public attention. As I say, many of ideas in it you know already. Um, I want to make it a political priority, and in particular to talk about why love and care matters. Because we just published a paper on that in Hypatia, the Journal of Feminist Philosophy lately, on the whole concept of love per se. And then I will talk about the neglect of it in Ireland, and what I think is very serious issues. I'm going to take some concrete examples of how I see how trivialised uh, care of people has actually become, taking examples particularly from the rise of commercialization. The commercialization of the care of the elderly, the commercialization of res residential care, and even, I would argue, the single affordable childcare program is actually fundamentally a commercial program. So, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about those and why I think it's a problem and draw some conclusions. So I suppose the claim I'm making here is that affective relations, which we have defined as relations of love, care, and solidarity, exercise the same structural role in relation to our relational life. I've been very influenced by South American writers in philosophy who are writing about relationality as fundamental to humanity. Um, uh, and that economic relations exercise in relation to our structural life. I suppose for Descartes, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. For Marx, you know, I work with nature, I create the world, material world, and for Adam Smith, therefore I make, therefore I am. But I suppose what, and it's very much in line with what David was saying, but I feel therefore I am is not part of our public narrative. So the concept of effective equality is about integrating a concept of dependency and interdependency into our debates about equality, human rights, and citizenship. I work a good bit with the law faculty and in UCD, and I suppose that, I think, is an enormous issue because human rights language, I don't know if there are many lawyers here, as you know, because it's influenced by dominant theories in political theory, it doesn't really treat the issue of care and love or solidarity as human rights issues. So I'm saying there are two dimensions to this, and they matter politically, because inequalities in the receipt of love and care is a serious human deprivation. If we deprive a child of food or a, an elderly person in a care home of food, we would regard it as elder abuse or child abuse. But when we deprive people of the right to intimacy, as we did, for example, for people with intellectual disabilities often when we incarcerated them and didn't allow them to have sexual relationships or intimate relationships, we deny them rights to intimacy. So the right to intimacy and the right to be loved, I think, is a fundamental human right. And that needs to be developed in international law and within national jurisdictions. And of course, it exacerbates other injustices, which is where I'm going to start. Both one influences the other. But also, we cannot look, and I, this I feel very strongly about, without looking at who does love and care work. It is mostly women. In the unpaid sector, it is mostly women. And it isn't, I would strongly disagree from our research on effective equality, and more recently, I've just done a huge study with colleagues in UCD funded by the Irish Research Council on working, um, learning and caring across the higher education sector in Ireland. It is certainly not something that men can't do. 
men are just as good at loving and caring as women. It's just our cultural milieu has defined hegemonic masculinity in terms of dominance rather than in terms of nurturing. So I'm just saying that it's deeply gendered, it's increasingly raced, as migrant workers dominate low-paid work, especially in uh, the care sectors of the economy. And of course, it's globalised because we have a globalised care chain. So I, I'm setting, I suppose, the debate in that wider context. But if you take where we stand now and what dominates our public discourse, um, you have no debate in Ireland, really, about care. If you talk about love or care in the public domain, people think it's soft talk, it's trivial. Because liberal political theory is the dominant perspective in public policy. And it assumes this universalistic view of citizenship from Marshall, which is, of course, that people are singular, mostly male, in their identity, and that they have no gender, no race, no sexuality, no differences in ability, and that they are a single type, a fixed identity. And it has been defined in terms of civil, political and social rights. That is how we define citizenship. Much of our law protects civil rights, freedom of association, freedom of movement, the right to own property. They're all very well protected to control your own body. And civil rights are exercised through the courts. We have political rights, the right to exercise political power and councils, parliament, etc. Although in the liberal political sphere, we have ignored the reality of power and abuse in the intimate sphere of the family. And that is a huge reflects the gendered nature of the concept of citizenship and indeed the child indifferent nature and the vulnerability indifferent nature of the concept of citizenship. And social rights which we have and particularly social security and welfare, healthcare, are largely if we look at what's happened through EU law and indeed in our own domestic law, it's mostly rights that accrue to us, a lot of them accrue to us through our rights as an employee. They don't accrue to us simply because we're human, but because we have our pensions, etc., are largely labour-related rights. So what I'm saying here is that citizen is defined, in a sense, in this manner. There is a denial of emotions and effective relations. It's based on Cartesian rationalism, uh, homo sapiens, not homo sentience. And under neoliberalism in particular, the rational economic actor model of the citizen. And I'll come to this later on when I refer to it again. But if you change, take the change in the nomenclature that has happened from social welfare to um, what, uh, what do they call the, the thing you get now? You have to uh, work related welfare, um, not unemployment to assist. Pardon? Yeah. Where, in fact, we have changed the language. You have to be worker, basically looking for work, job seekers. So we've moved from welfare, which says you're entitled to welfare, to saying you are only entitled to welfare if you're a job seeker. That nomenclature is enormously significant. It shows that we've moved from a citizen with rights, even to welfare on labour market terms, to somebody who only has it if they're looking for a job. It's autonomous view of the person. Ideally, we have now these ludicrous things, sorry, I really do think they're ludicrous, graduation from preschools, graduations. <laughs> Uh, they're absolutely ludicrous. But what it says is about autonomy. Because the assumption is, is to be virtuous is to be autonomous. And that is reflected in the ideology of choice. I'm working with the Professor of Palliative Care in UCD on a big study in relation to palliative care and social justice. And one of the things we've published a couple of papers lately on it with some colleagues, he'll tell you about them if you want to know. But anyhow, what I suppose is this ideology of choice. It assumes that everybody can choose, but many times in life, people are not capable of choosing because of their illness or their mental capacity, etc. But it is glorified, the, the right to choose, even, of course, I'm not denying the importance of autonomy, but I'm only saying sometimes it does not recognise the vulnerability of the human condition, especially at the point of end of life. And the person is assumed to be non-relational that we make the self-interested view of the person, and that so dominates public discourse. If you look at our political discussions in our newspapers, everything is about what group's game can be won and who can win what game. There is no concept of how we could create a better society or solidarity or community. It's all assumption is that the citizen is self-interested rather than other interested. I'm not denying that people are self-interested, but they are not only self-interested. 
they are more than that because we have, through our emotionality and our interdependence and our deep dependency, we are actually deeply tied to other people and we are other-centred as well as centred. So the, what I'm saying, the public adult citizen who can enter into contract is actually the definition of the citizen. That means children, people who are in prison, people who are uh, intellectually not capable of maybe engaging in public debate, are often excluded from that definition of citizenship. So I'm saying here, there are huge inequalities, and this, I think, social justice is a big issue. As it's framed now, if you take our laws, they protect the first sphere of inequality is the economic. There's no question about it. You know, if you can't eat, you can't live. That's very basic. So class inequality is the first, and the economic inequality is foundational. And we have, under our equal status and our equality legislation, of course, recognised the second sphere here, which is the cultural forms of inequality, through respecting differences, through gender, sexuality, age, religion, ethnicity, etc. Disability. I don't like the word disability because I think it is a negative prefix, and I've said this many times. I think it should be called diff ability, not differences in ability rather than disability. <laughs> And the political system where parity of representation and the exercise of power. So those are three areas where people talk and discuss justice. But we do not discuss justice in the affective domain. Because that realm of justice has been left outside political theory. It is assumed to be a private matter, the personal responsibility of the family. And that has meant not alone do we not talk about the need for care or how we facilitate, let's say you're commuting two hours a very common where I work, two hours a day, back and forth to work. How does that affect your care relationships, your love relationships? There is no discussion of that. It's not been taken seriously as we price people out of living in the city of Dublin. And the unequal sharing of all this work, because of course, uh, the resolution, as I said, is relational justice, because women are disproportionately doing unpaid work, lowly paid care work in all sectors of the economy. So I think that, that what I'm trying to do is to argue that these four systems, the resolutions, are resources, respect, representational and relational, and they all intersect. And that, I think, is a very important point for those of you who work in this area, is if you take the, the red and the red, the, I suppose what are generative sources of injustice is class inequality. We have a 22% of people in this country earn less than €24,000 a year per annum who are employed. You cannot live on €24,000 a year in many of the big urban centres. So, of course, they are with poverty comes economic inequality, but a lot more comes with lack of respect for you and your position. Lack of power, because you often lack the time and resources to engage in politics. And of course, you know, there is a great expression, when hunger comes in the door, love runs out the window. Because your relational injustices arise from poverty. And there is no question about that. Many of the people who deal in the services that you work in are people who are poor, because they do not have the resources to bribe private therapy in our very commercialised care economy. So the political system, I would put in the quintessential, if you like, the generative source of injustice in the power area is probably reflected in the status of children and people who are institutionalised against their will. I would take people often in care against their will, including, I would argue, increasingly older people who are incarcerated in nursing homes, often against their will. There is no discussion of this here. Where is their political representation? I don't know if it's extremely difficult to get to study people in those positions because you will not be given access by the gatekeepers who own these care places. So there is the, the who can be speak and whose voice can be heard in the public domain. Why, for example, are most of the people in prison men? And why does nobody take their care needs seriously? Because people don't think that intimacy matters for men. They don't. I know, I deal a lot with Preetfield and Midlands and many prisons because they're powerless. They're totally powerless. So what I'm saying, children are often in the same position. They have no right of representation except through mediated through adults. So all of those things affect all their other statuses, their access to money, their access to care, 
their assets, the respect that we have for them. In the cultural system, there are many groups that fit in here. Traditionally, I suppose, in the, the people who were gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, had, I suppose, a quintessential example of people who lacked respect. But in fact, we know now that travellers are the group who probably experience this still, mostly in this country, as do people who are, whose skin colour is black. So there is a lack of our people who are deaf where, because we do not recognise deaf sign language. And that has enormous implications for people, what they can earn, where they can go, whether they can go for promotion because maybe their sexuality will become known. So it has economic implications and of course up to very recently it had very serious love implications for people who were uh, LGBT in the, that community. But the affective system is a two-way street because it's about who is deprived of that. And that is a very big question. For example, people who are in asylum here in this country who are, for example, not allowed, there's very difficult to get your families to come back into the country when you do get refugee status because we don't actually recognise relationality as, and the absence of intimacy as an injustice. And it affects your ability to work. If you have deprived of care and love, as many of you know, you will often have mental health issues. You will not be able to actually work or you will not be able to politically represent, etc. So what I'm saying is, when we look at injustices, we need to look at how they all are interrelated together and how the care and love injustices are integrated with others. So what we're doing, I suppose, is I'm challenging the mainstream theory of justice and the mainstream political frame that there is in the country in which we discuss issues of social justice. The recognizing the relational character of human beings, the vulnerability of the human condition, our sentient beings, and that we are, care is not only in the private domain, but in the public domain. And when David was talking, he was referring, I know, indirectly to the spirit level by Wilkinson and Pickett. And of course, there is a very clear example of where public solidarity in the sense of the greater resources and taxation put into public services creates a better ethos in society, better health and well-being for people. So it's not just a private issue. Love and care is not just a private matter because it brings a normative dimension to decision making. And that, I suppose, is what I, I feel very strongly is that people are ethical as well as self-interested. Most people are moral beings if they are allowed to be and enabled to be and that dependence in our cultural context and how we create that narrative in our society. So these are the two inequalities occurs when we, people are deprived of care, when the burdens are unequally distributed and when the care of humans and their well-being is not recognised. For example, we have no formal education in this country on how to care and love in, in a really systematic way. Yes, we have relationships and sexuality education, but everybody knows that that is a very small part of education and you can leave school without knowing anything about your relational self. And that it is trivialised by omission. Any time I have been on Vincent Brown a number of times, a political programme here for those who don't know, and I often say to him, why don't you do programmes about this? And he said, because people see it as soft and irrelevant and apolitical. So I think that's a very interesting question. So this is a, a model, if you like, of how published in Sociological Review on how we would regard the relationships in which we live, that we are not just economic actors or political actors or cultural actors, that we live in, in if you like, care maps and in relational world where the intimate care sphere, where primary intimate relationships are formed in the tertiary care area where we do care work through teaching, nursing, social work, mental health services, child care services, etc. And then where we do political work through care in the form of solidarity. And I just define them here, they're at length in my notes. But I suppose the first is a very primary one where there's high levels of interdependency. Some are chosen as when we choose to have a partner or we choose to have a friend. Some we inherit it like our brothers or sisters and some we choose to have or maybe not to have children. Uh, but this, this is a very fundamental area of care, but the secondary care sphere is equally very important. The professional sphere that you were talking about this morning, but I think there is, and often one can mutate to the other, because often social care workers can in fact develop and do develop, we know from research, primary care relationships with people for whom they care. And of course, 
Solidarity is the social and political form of love. That's what it is. It's where we pay our taxes to redistribute wealth. It's where we work in solidarity with social movements around the world. It's other than through our own self-interest. So I'm saying it's political because our survival depends on it. There is no species that is, is as dependent as humans at the point of birth. We are so dependent. And we are dependent if we live long enough, and many of you are young enough to know from my research in palliative care, um, to tell you that mo many of you here will have at least two, three, or four or five years of high dependency care before you die, given how young you are. That is the reality. And human flourishing depends on it. People cannot live, our environment, our politics, our culture cannot survive uh, and flourish without care. It produces outcomes. Care, uh, care and love is productive, and the absence of it is very destructive, producing anxiety, poor health, including public health. And it's work, because I think this is the big issue that I think feminists have brought to this discussion. The idea that this is not work is absurd. The idea, and as you know, under our constitution, we have this ludicrous thing where women's duty to care at home, as if men had no duty to care, as if it was the prerogative of women, and if it was only a duty. It's work. It's competence. It requires commitment, attentiveness. It requires having a care map going round in your head, as someone said to me. And it involves stress and joy. And I'd like to seek your comment, especially on this issue, because why love matters? Uh, because without love, we are not produced as relational human beings, without the investment of nurturing. And some of us are very lucky. Uh, we inherit a lot of nurture, others inherit less so. But it is as real sociologically as inheriting money. And what I think we ignore often when we discuss these issues is in fact that there are nurturing inheritances through communities, in neighbourhoods, in families, in social networks, and in, in many other ways through friendships. And life without love is significantly lesser than it has the capacity to be. And they're distinguishable as well from other forms of caring, mostly because it's non-substitutable. And I think that's a huge issue in our society where there's an argument that everything can be commodified. In many ways, love's work is inalienable work. And what I fear is from the research we're doing on uh, people in employment is people feel they have less and less time to love. That is a major finding from this study we're doing, from people at all levels working across education sectors, for including doormen, people who are working in uh, the boiler room, people who are working in admin, people who are working in catering, people who are professors, people who are managers. People don't feel they have time to love. And because love is generated in the intentions and feelings of others, you can't buy it and sell it, because it's in a disposition that's voluntary and person-specific. And in what I have called wrote a paper in 1989 in Sociological Review on love labour, love labouring relations, the person doing the care is inseparable from the caregiving. Love is not a service. It's not something you can buy in the market. So if we make our society unsustainable through giving people no resources or time to do love and care, then we will create an unsustainable society. And you have to be personally present uh, in some way. You can't be partially physically present to another person. And it can't be signed without altering the nature of the relationship. You can't pay someone to go out to dinner with your partner and pretend it is yourself. It is <laughs> absurd. So what I'm saying is the non-commodifiability. <laughs> but I know that's funny, but it's actually, people do argue in the literature that everything can be commodified. I do presume you know in Japan now they have robots increasingly to care for people in substitution for human beings. In. So what I'm saying, the, logics, the logic of this world is completely different. It is a different temporal logic. You can't be done in measurable time because nurturing needs are dictated, the time frames are not by economics but or by policy logic, but by the logic of need. And equally, it's not infinitely condensable. This idea that you can do fast care, as I say, like fast food in standardized packages. Well, you can't, because time-defined care leads to pre-packaged units of supervision. 
And that is certainly happening, I know, for sure and certain, in work we've done with uh, people who are being cared for now, especially older people in community care, where everything is being time defined. 10 minutes to wash, 10 minutes to get somebody up, 10 minutes to feed them. That is insulting to humans' relationships. And it is a complete misunderstanding of what it is to care for another human being. To reduce them to define package of care, and that's what they're called in this country, care packages, home care packages. And care is dictated by need. It has no clear boundaries. When it ends, no time, the effort and investment, and of course, therefore, it's a site of conflict and a site of stress. And I can speak from extensive personal experience, having minded my mother, she must belong to that category of great long livers. She lived to be 104 until last year. And so did her sisters live well into their late 90s. So, but one of the things you learn if you have cared for the elderly yourself and people, especially as they move into dementia and have other issues, is there is no time logic. There is no clear way in which you can quantify how much you have done. And I'm saying the rationality of caring is different from others. It, it contradicts scientific and bureaucratic rationality. Yet that is precisely what we are trying to do with the machinery of the state and our service level agreements to monitor everything, quantify everything, and reduce people to numbers. It is, I think, at completely at variance with the nature of care. And I'd like to go back now to go back to the political issue, because is democracy, Joan Tronto has written a great book called um, a Caring Democracy, which I think is a very good book on the whole political theory of care and its relationship to matter. We talk about democracy. We have a democracy, yes. A democracy is about parity of representation and the exercise of power. But democracy has to have a purpose. And I would argue that the ethic of care could be inform our political purposes much more so than it does at, at, at the moment. Because it isn't just a mode of action, it's a disposition in action. How maybe the empathy that you're talking about at a personal level, but also at a political level. Entering into the world of people who are not like ourselves and creating a political system that respects that. It's a way of relating ethically through attentiveness, responsiveness, informed other-centeredness. And not just in relation to human beings, but of course in relation to the environment and to other living creatures on the planet. So I think the big issue, and this is a serious issue, especially for feminist politics, but for all politics, the urgency and imminence of high dependency caring removes both the carers and care receivers, especially I'm thinking of people who are very ill, who have very high dependency needs, uh, from public engagement where politics is lived and practiced. You literally can't leave somebody who has to be turned three times a day and go off to a march. You can't leave the baby at home to feed itself for two days. It doesn't happen. And that, I think, is the crux of the problem politically. The urgency and imminence of that work excludes the very people who should be in the public domain making claims and making demands on the political system. And it's a weakening of democracy. Uh, women, those children, intellectually disabled people, often the incarcerated, those in direct provision. There are no means, no capacity, in some cases, in the case of direct provision, no resources uh, to be politically significant. So they are denied parity of representation in public life. And in my view, that has greatly impoverished democracy. I want to give some examples now. This is the Irish census. 2016. This is the question about who's a carer. And this is how we make care invisible. A carer is anyone who provides regular unpaid personal help for a friend or family member with a long-term illness, health problem or disability. No mention of people who are childcare minders because they're not defined as carers by the census because it's assumed it's your duty as a mother particularly to do so. So you have 1.2 million people who are still carers of children as well, and many, not as many as there were, still working at home full time in that job, but they're not defined as carers at all. And people say, oh, we have 160,000 or 180,000 carers. And I go, what? We have 1.2 million people who have primary responsibility for the care of children, and many of those, especially those, also care for adults. So I'm just saying, women are almost two and a half times as likely to be carers of children than men, but carers of children alone aren't counted in the national census as carers. 
first omission. Sorry. This is the gender cost of caring in this country from the Quartini National Household Survey in 2013. Women aged 20 and men aged 20 to 44. 63% of women are employed with that age group, compared with 82% of men overall. And when you look at the next figure, you see why. Because that varies from 86% with women with no children, which is almost identical with men with no children, to 59.5% for women whose youngest child was aged between 0 and 3. Because, of course, the cost of childcare, the failure to recognise it as a support service that people actually need if they're employment, and the lack of long-term planning in that area. But this has enormous implications for people who are carers, especially when they get old. And even people say there's no wage gap. Well, there's a very recent study by consultants, McKinley and Morgan, and with UL involved. There is a 20% wage gap as well. And much of that is attributed to the fact that women often have to take leave. They have to take uh, time out for childcare. They do an awful lot of the care work in the households. We know that from the ESRI study. So in fact, their wage gap is not unrelated to that status, as indeed is the fact that in where there are bonuses, women on average are 50% less bonuses than men. And the average income, and this is where it becomes a crucial factor, for women when they get old, 55 to 65 in 2008, we don't have the most recent data, was 55% or 53% of that of men. So there is a huge care cost for those who do informal care right throughout employment and into older age. And of course, I, can, I know you won't be able to see this, but consistent poverty rates are much, much greater for people who have high care responsibilities parents who are caring on their own, in particular the high bars, and they've gone up in 2013, and people where households where there are a large number of children and again a number of adults. So I'm just making the point that poverty is central to the care issue, as well of course is gender. And austerity. Who suffered? Many people suffered, but let's be clear who suffered a lot. Children's enforced deprivation. As you know, in this country, we have deprivation indicators. In 2007, 12% were deprived of two basic necessities. In 2013, it was almost 32.5%. Children suffered. Single parents, most of whom are women, their deprivation rates for them were almost twice in 2013 of what they were in 2008. And illness and disability related unemployed theirs was, rose from 36% to 53% in 2013. They cut back the carers grant, it was restored last year by 20%, and they cut back home pair hours by almost one fifth. So all I'm saying is public policy in reality, despite the rhetoric, is very careless. And we made that observation in a paper we've written on a book on austerity, and I see the minister, Pascal, whatever his name is, is it Donovan? <laughs> He actually reviewed it in the paper and he said using the word careless was political ideology, which I just find unbelievable given the data, but anyhow. So what I want to comment too on is commercialization, because that is another angle in which we have decided to commercialize care. Since 2006, the home care market, we have 150 for-profit companies. You can have these slides if anybody wants them. We will put them up. I have a website, the Irish Research Council. If you look me up on academia.eu or in UCD, you'll find this website. 150 for-profit companies, mostly for older people, but also for children in residential care. You have tax breaks, which were only meant to be for the non-profit sector, were given to the for-profit sector. And the Home Care Association is very upfront. In 2009, wrote a report and said that it was a major <coughs> home care market for profit uh, that they could avail of. And it's mainly made and proposed to the government that they could reduce costs by reducing wages and con labour conditions primarily. For whom? For women workers, for migrant workers, for low wage workers. That is, no securities, no pensions absolute exploitation in many ways in the care industry, and it's not confined to one sector. We have this whole new marketization of disability services. 
saying the user purchaser, it sounds very liberating and to choose, etc. But the administrative cost of running that for somebody who is maybe intellectually disabled or their family and everything is enormous. And it's a way in which, again, the state is absolving of its responsibility to actually give proper services where people need them. And you have care of older persons. Uh, active nursing homes. People don't realise three quarters of our beds and places in nursing homes now are run by the for-profit sector. They're run to make money. That's what they're run for. They're all companies that are some on the stock market, some not. But if you follow the business sections of the Financial Times and other newspapers, you will see that the home care market has become enormous and it's seen as a way of making money. At the same time, our health service executive closed almost 2,000 beds between 2010 and 2012, so people are forced into the for-profit sector. Residential childcare, Magella Monkeen, who's a PhD student with me and who's a lecturer in IT Sligo, has written a very good paper on this, showing, for example, more than half the homes for children in residential care are now for-profit companies. So I'm just saying it's the only expanding area of residential care with huge issues in relation to conditions of employment in that sector as well. And I can't want to say that when people talked about empathy and caring and all. Well, if you're a low wage worker and you're doing 10 hours here and two hours there, your ability for empathy is greatly reduced as you struggle to survive because you're not paid for the hour that you transition between working in this house and that house and another house. There is no security. So what I go back to say is there's commercialization of care evident in the market language we use. The idea of customers in a democracy is just absurd. We have moved from citizens to customers to clients. That's what I want to talk about. Unemployment assistance chain to job seekers, probation and welfare, <laughs> they removed the word welfare. Uh, the revenue commissioners, in case you don't know, you're a customer. I'd say you're not a customer because if you refuse to pay your tax, you quickly find out you weren't a customer. <laughs> but so I'm just saying the same applies to social protection. There are 2,200 references to customers on their website. The health service executive is replete with reference to customers. You cannot be a customer to a human right because it's not something you purchase on the market. And the invasion of that language into our public services, I think, reflects a mindset in Ireland whereby we are intellectually asleep in relation to how neoliberal commercial thinking has invaded the actual care areas of our lives. And what I'm saying is it matters because it's central to our humanity and it's interwoven with other injustice. That's, I don't want to bore you, but I just say these dominant theories of justice are about regulating with changers. They don't find the person as a relational being. And that, I think, is an enormous issue. And you know, we're not only status-led, power-led and money-led, we are also relational beings and our relationality makes us ethical and that ethical dimension of life can be brought into public discourse. So I ask, why is there no discussion about this in this country? Why are for-profit hospital, nursing home, care providers allowed to advertise as if they weren't for profit? Anyone who knows, I won't go and name any particular one, but I'm sure you could not miss the advertisements on the television for one particular large for-profit provider uh, who constantly talk about, oh, the intimacy and the care. It is absurd. Nobody can provide that in a context where people are not employed in excellent or good and secure working conditions. But that is the way this country has gone. And I'm just saying, is it right? Uh, to care for the most vulnerable as a source of profit making and what about the people who do the care work because if we then don't have good employment conditions I don't think they have will have the resources the energy or the time to be caring for other people so there are some of my questions thank you very much